uh, welcome Yingli, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a great honor to uh, present at this virtual market design seminar series. And I also want to thank everyone for coming. So this is joint work with uh, Ajada from Duke and also Bruno from uh, Northwestern. I think Ajada is also here in the audience today. So this project uh, is largely inspired by Heather Sarson's job market paper or medical referrals. Uh, in fact, the three of the, us started working on this project uh, right after her job market talk at Northwestern. So in this medical referral market, male and female surgeons compete for referrals from physicians. Physicians gather new information about a surgeon's ability only if the surgeon performs a surgery. Now, male and female surgeons have comparable abilities. As documented by Sarsons, in her sample, women have a lower average ability and a slightly lower variance of ability, but the differences are really small. Okay. So this figure two from her paper shows the distribution of surgeon ability. Uh, the solid curve here is the distribution for men. The dashed curve here is the distribution for women. As we can see, the two curves are very close to each other. So this type of market structure is very general. Workers from different social groups compete for tasks. Uh, employers learn, about, learn more about a worker's productivity only if the worker performs a task. Now, employer learning and the task allocation are inseparable. Employers believe today will affect today's allocation, which will affect employers' belief tomorrow. That belief will affect uh, tomorrow's task allocation. And that allocation will further affect employers' belief on the day after tomorrow. Okay. Lastly, different social groups have comparable productivity distributions. One group might have or might be expected to have a lower average productivity but the differences across groups are really, really small, okay? So in this type of market, we want to understand how does workers group belonging? For instance, their gender or race affect their lifetime payoffs, okay? When workers are young, research has documented that employers use workers group belonging to infer how productive workers are. Okay. But what happens in the long run? In particular, we want to understand whether the impact of such early career discrimination vanish or intensify over time. Okay. Lastly, as groups' productivity distributions converge, we want to understand if their payoffs will converge too. Okay. Now, for this last question, uh, there are two opposite conjectures. The first conjecture is that the worker's group belonging has very little impact on his or her lifetime payoff. This conjecture makes some sense because different groups have very, very similar productivity distributions. Okay. Moreover, employers get chances to learn about workers' productivity, so they will reallocate opportunities accordingly. The opposite conjecture is that group belonging has significant impact despite the fact that different social groups are very comparable in terms of productivity. This conjecture also makes some sense. Employers learn about workers' productivity only if workers perform tasks. So the opportunities to perform tasks really matter in our environment. We all know that without those early opportunities to perform, it's really hard for a worker to move up the career ladder. So in this paper, we show that the right conjecture or the answers to the previous questions depend crucially on how the employers learn about workers' productivity. Certain employer learning environments deliver comparable payoffs to comparable social groups. So we call such learning environments self-correcting ones. 
other learning environments translate a small prior difference into large payoff disparities across different social groups. We call such learning environments spiraling ones. Okay. So what is the major difference between a self-correcting and a spiraling environment? Uh, without giving too much detail at this preview stage, uh, we can think about the self-correcting environments as those that track successes. Spiraling environments are those that track failures. Okay. Any questions so far? So if you have any questions, just uh, speak up. Okay. Uh, I, I, I would actually have a question, if I may. Um, yes. so, um, I find that super interesting, um, just to understand better. Um, so you're going to assume if somebody is not hired or so that uh, she will not produce um, any signals, because I could imagine then you just go and work elsewhere and you also produce signals about uh, how skilled you are. How are you going to tackle that? Uh, so uh, that's a very good question, right? So um, we can think about basically what you are saying is that maybe there is some exogenous signal arriving about the worker's ability over time, right? Uh, adding a little bit of exogenous signal would not upset our result. And you will see later very, uh, uh, very soon. Okay. But thank you very much for the question, yeah. Um, and, now, and are you going to abstract completely from taste-based discrimination? Because we know that this exists as well. Um, oh, that's a great question. Yes. Uh, so for this paper, uh, we are going to focus on state uh, statistical discrimination alone. Yeah. But thank you. You are, you are exactly pointing out where I'm going to go. I will talk about the taste-based versus statistical-based in the literature review slide. But thank you. Mm. Okay, so uh, that's uh, so this contrast between self-correcting and the spiraling environment uh, persists uh, both with fixed wages and even with flexible wages. Right, so one would expect that flexible wages might be able to cure this spiraling, but we show that it doesn't. So we show that in a spiraling employer learning environment, comparable groups face very different wage paths even if their productivity distributions are arbitrarily close to each other. So this picture shows the predicted wage path for two groups. So group A is the favored group and group B is the discriminated group. As you can see, the wage gap between these two comparable groups uh, expands and persists for a substantial amount of time. Right? So this result is consistent with a recent statement on gender salary equity by Association of Women Surgeons. Uh, they claim that the disparities women face in compensation at entry-level positions lead to a persistent trend of unequal pay for equal work throughout the course of their careers. This result is also consistent with the empirical evidence that the racial wage gaps are small at early career stages, but wider with labor market experience in certain occupations. Right. So lastly, we also explore what happens if we allow the workers to invest in their productivity before they enter the labor market. We show that the contrast between spiraling and the self-correcting environments still persists, even when workers can invest in their productivity. So spiraling environments polarize workers' incentives to invest across different groups. Workers from favored groups invest a lot, but workers from the discriminated groups invest very little. In contrast, self-correcting environments lead to more equalized incentives to invest across groups. So investment would not be able to uh, fix the spiraling problem either. So that's a very quick overview for the uh, for the main results. Any questions so far? Yeah, can I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. About, so about the graph that you had like three slides ago. Yeah. So you have the time in the x-axis. So is it supposed to represent like the lifetime of a single worker or is this across generations? Uh, lifetime of the single cohort. Yeah. Okay. So there is also the possibility of like across cohorts, you update over the beliefs, uh, over the ability of a group, but I think you're going to abstract away from that and just take the beliefs um, as given. Yeah, that's a very good question. So we are not uh, modeling that yet. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, okay, as I promised, Laura, this is a very, very high, I'm going to give a very, very high level 
uh, literature review of the paper uh, given the time constraint. So this is a model about statistical discrimination. Uh, we are not going to model taste-based discrimination. There is no distaste for any social group in our model. Moreover, all the participants in, our, in the labor market are Bayesian. So in particular, the employers don't discount good news from women, nor do they exaggerate bad news from women. So in that case, we offer a different theory for the wage and uh, employment gap in the surgery market than Sarsen's job market paper. Okay. So within this uh, literature of statistical discrimination, there are two subfields. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, the paper by Phelps and the papers follow Phelps. They assume that there is an ex exogenous and a significant difference across different social groups. So due to that exogenous difference, of course, different social groups will fare very differently. Uh, we differ from this field in the sense that we assume difference across groups, but we look at what happens when this difference is vanishingly small. Okay, so in all these models, when the difference is very small, there is no group difference. Okay. The second uh, subfield is uh, the paper by error and the, the papers that follow this uh, uh, paper by error. So they assume that different social groups are exactly the same. Uh, they fail very differently in the labor market because they happen to play different equilibria when there are multiple equilibria, or they happen to take different roles in an equilibria. So uh, we, of course, differ from that, and we are not going to do any equilibrium selection uh, in the paper. So the, uh, moreover, we also contribute to uh, cumulative discrimination, discrimination in hiring and referral uh, practice, employer learning, and a bandit uh, approach. Okay, if there is no question, uh, I'll move to the model. Any questions? For the So uh, I'm going to begin a very simple model with one employer and two workers. You can think about this as an illustrating example. And then later in the talk, I will talk about what happens when there are many workers from each group and many employers. I would also talk about a flexible wage. Today, we probably would not have time for investment in productivity. Okay. So for this baseline model, uh, we have one employer and two workers, worker A and worker B. So we can think about the, these two workers as, uh, so these two works come from different social groups. We can think about the A as man and the B as woman. And to make life easier, I just refer to all the participants as he, okay. Now worker I's type or productivity is either high or low. So I use theta I to denote worker I's type. H represents high type, L represents low type. So the employer does not know the worker's type at time zero. So employer's belief is PI that worker I is a high type. We assume that worker A is X anti more productive. So PB is smaller than PA, but we are going to take PB to be super close to PA. And we want to examine what happens when PB is super close to PA. Uh, for this case, we say that workers are comparable. Right, so they have very similar expected productivity. Okay. Now, uh, every day, this employer has a task to allocate. So he wants to allocate this task to a high type or high productivity worker. So he gets V dollars if the task goes to a worker of high type. He gets zero if it goes to a worker of low type. For the worker, uh, he only wants to be performing the task like performing a surgery, right? So he gets a fee for that. We assume that the worker gets $1 if he performs a task and he gets zero if uh, he uh, stays idle in that period. Now, you can think about this W as a fixed wage. So later on, we are going to allow this W to be endogenous, okay? Now, uh, we're going to uh, assume that the employer learns about worker's productivity only if worker I performs a task, uh, as in the surgery example, the surgeon uh, employer learns about a surgeon's ability only if the surgeon performs a surgery. We're going to contrast the two different employer learning environment. 
The first one is uh, called breakthrough learning. So in this environment, if the task is performed by a low type worker, nothing happens. You don't see any signal. But if the task is performed by a high type worker, a breakthrough sometimes will occur. Okay. So for this audience, the best example is academia jobs, right? So if it, we have a incapable uh, researcher, he is not going to generate a breakthrough. But if we have a capable researcher, he might be unlucky and he is not guaranteed to generate a breakthrough for sure. So this is uh, the breakthrough environment we have in mind. The opposite side is uh, breakdown learning. So under breakdown learning, if the task is performed by a high type worker, nothing happens. But if the task is mistakenly assigned to a low type worker, a breakdown might occur sometime, okay? So for this comparison between breakthrough and breakdown learning, we can think about this breakthrough or breakdown learning as an intrinsic feature of the job, the position, uh, the occupation that we are considering. We are not the first to observe that different jobs correspond to different employer learning environments. Right. So based on the observation by Jacobs, Barron and Krebs coined these two terms called star jobs versus guardian jobs. So star jobs correspond to our breakthrough environment and the guardian jobs correspond to our breakdown environment. So here is another example of star jobs. The first rate salesman can often add a significant increment to the performance of his organization while his inferior will not impose unacceptable costs, right? So we can think about this as another example of breakthrough learning. Now for guardian jobs, uh, here are two examples. The airline pilot who misses a landing or the operative who blocks a assembling line will produce very destructive effects, but an outstanding performance will not be noticed or will go will be of little consequence for the organization. So that is uh, that are two examples we have for the for the guardian jobs. Any questions so far? Um, if, if I may, um, um, what what bugs me here is you relate this exercise to the gender gap, and I thought the gender gap is something which is socially inefficient, but in your model, it I have the impression that it is actually efficient to discriminate uh, between the slightly better group A and the slightly worst group B. So it would be socially the good thing to kick group B out of the market. And is, is this the right way to see what you're doing? Um, so uh, I think what we're saying is that uh, we're not saying that this is uh, efficient, right? So actually this relates to one policy recommendation we are going to give in the end of the talk. So uh, you're going to see in the breakdown learning environment, if the employer closes his eyes and don't, uh, I mean, don't see the gender or the race of the workers, the employer is not going to do much worse. Actually, he's doing the same. So we are actually saying that here, there is a very easy improvement in terms of uh, gender uh, equality. And when we hire a, a worker, we try to, if it's possible, we try to hide this type of information. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you're okay. But that's a very good observation. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Uh, May I ask something? Hey, go ahead. Yeah. I assume that there is a generalization somewhere of these like breakthrough and breakdowns. Like there are two signals, neither are conclusive. High is arriving faster for high type workers, low is arriving faster for low type workers, etc. Mm. Um, is that like a, is it possible to generalize these things by saying that if the ratio is high enough, then this is more like the breakthrough model and et cetera? Yes, yes. So uh, you're pointing to an uh, extension we're looking at. So, so far here, we assume that in breakthrough environment, only high type can generate, break, uh, can generate a breakthrough. And in the breakdown environment, only low type can generate a breakdown. So in the paper, we actually, generalize uh, the model to inconclusive breakthrough and inconclusive breakdowns. So in that model, both types can generate breakthroughs, but high type generates it faster. 
uh, and uh, also both types can generate breakdowns, but the uh, low type generates breakdown faster. So that's one extension we uh, did in the paper. There is a, another extension, it's like you can think about in an occupation, like in academia job, for example, we can generate breakthroughs, but we can also generate a scandal, right? So that's a breakdown that has a huge impact on the organization. Uh, so we can incorporate both. But what we didn't do it in the paper, but what matters is, as you can see, how the belief will go without any breakthrough or any breakdown, whether the belief shoots up or goes down. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you for the questions. Yeah. So uh, before moving to the main result, I want to uh, formally summarize the model. So uh, time T is, uh, so we look at a continuous time model. T represents time and uh, all the players uh, have the same discount rate R. So the employer faces a standard bandit problem. Worker A and worker B are two bandit arms with priors PA and PB. So uh, PA is higher than PB. At each T, uh, we allocate, the employee wants to allocate the task to whoever is more likely to have a high type or have a high productivity. Um, if after some time, both workers look too unproductive, look too terrible, uh, the employer will turn to his outside option. We assume that there is a safe arm and which generates a no flow payoff to the employer. So for the breakthrough learning environment, for the conclusive breakthrough learning environment, if the task goes to a high type, breakthrough occurs at poison rate lambda H. And if in the breakdown environment, if the task goes to a low type, breakdown occurs at poison rate lambda L. Okay, so that's uh, a formal summary of our model. Any questions so far? Okay, good. So uh, um, let's first look at what happens in this very stylized, simple uh, uh, model. So we begin with breakthrough learning environment. So this breaks, uh, I want to illustrate everything in this picture. So the X axis is time. Uh, the Y axis is the employer's belief that a worker has a high type. And at time zero, worker A is here. So PA is the prior belief worker A. Worker B is lower, PB. And the, the safe arm is PS. So whenever the belief uh, for both workers drop to PS, the employer turns to uh, the outside option. Now, at time zero, worker A looks better. So the employer will assign this task to worker A. And after some time, if worker A generates a breakthrough, he proves that he's a high type. So he is tenured from that point onward. He secures the job from that point onward. Now, if worker A doesn't generate a breakthrough, so employer will become more and more pessimistic that worker A is actually a high type. So the belief will drop and without any breakthrough. At some point, this belief will drop to PB. Okay, so this T star represents the time at which the belief for worker A drops to PB. And from that point onward, these two workers look identical to uh, the employer. He will let these two workers take turns to finish the task, right? So he first assign the task to B, and if B doesn't generate a breakthrough, he assign the task to A and he iterate uh, until at some point a worker generates a breakthrough and proves himself for instance, is worker B. So at that point, worker B will secure the job and gets, uh, gets tenured, okay. So if neither player generates uh, a breakthrough, after a long period of time, the belief will drop to the same, uh, drop to the safe arm, and then the employer will fire both, okay. So this dynamic shows that actually uh, the employer will just give worker A a grace period between zero and a T star. Basically, I tell worker A, you look better than the other guy, I give you a grace period. And uh, if you don't generate a breakthrough in that period, I will start iterating between, I will start iterating between you and the other guy, okay. Now, as PB goes to PA, as the two workers uh, become more and more similar, this grace period will shrink to zero. So this is exactly why this breakthrough learning environment is self-correcting. And when PB is going to PA, work B's expected payoff converges to work A's expected payoff because the grace period is shrinking to zero. Okay. Now, 
Uh, so here we have said uh, we have said this before. So now let's look at the opposite side. What happens in a breakdown learning environment? Any questions for the breakthrough before I move on? Just a very very quick uh, yeah question or comment. So um, I think you convinced uh, convinced us that you have these star drops and others think so too. And um, econ may be part of it, but also being a good surgeon may be a, a part of it. I don't know. Um, but if we don't see, you know, if we don't see the discrimination disappear, then your results also suggest that uh, it it cannot be so much the statistical discrimination, the rational statistical discrimination that drives it, right? And it means there must be something else happening somehow, right? You can take that away from your analysis in a sense, no? So in a breakthrough environment, right? So if the gap is not going away, then it is strong evidence that there is uh, other forms, right? So like implicit social norms, right? Saying that, uh, wives should do all the housework. So yes, I think that's, but in the breakdown environment, uh, if we see the gap, then uh, it can be due to the statistical discrimination. Yeah, good thing. <laughs> so uh, Ingni, I have one question. Yes. So um, the, the pattern of alternating um, in the breakthrough environment uh, yes. Do you spend real time for each type or do you sort of switch back and forth quickly? So, uh, so if we think about this as the limit of a discrete time version, then we are actually switching back and forth uh, uh, between the workers uh, very quickly, right? So each period we are switching. Right, so yeah, so your picture seemed to be suggesting that you yes. spend some significant amount of time, but that's not the case. Yeah, but actually... And, and yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you go. And then, so, and then if, if you can randomize them, can you also, do you want to randomize them between the two? You kind uh, of mix them every time, like hire them somehow for half of the productivity. Do you do that? Yeah. You, are, you, are, you, are, you are pointing exactly how, uh, how we do this. So in the continuous time limit, uh, in fact, we, we make an easy assumption. We assume that we can split the task, right? So from this yeah, piece yeah. onward, even though the picture is for iterating, because we believe that for the surgery, like you do have this discrete nature of tasks. So we iterate, but in the, uh, uh, in the paper, we actually uh, assume that the employer can split the task. So from this T star onward, each worker takes half of the task. Is that, the, re is that the reason why this, uh, the beliefs, uh, the, uh, the graph gets flatter after T-star? Yes, exactly. I think the very fact that uh, we are iterating, we, we, are, we are splitting the task between the two is exactly why there is a kink and the belief for each worker drops uh, slower than before. Yeah, okay. exactly right. Thank you. So uh, now let's look at the opposite side. Uh, let's look at what happens when uh, we have breakdown learning environment. So uh, this is the same picture as before. X axis is time. Y axis is the belief that the worker is a high type. And we still have worker A here. We have worker B here. So the first task will go to worker A. And without any uh, breakthrough, uh, without any breakdown, this worker A will just look better and better. So if I don't see a mess up situation, I don't see any breakdown, I become more and more confident that this worker A is a high type. So my belief shoots up. Now, if worker A is a high type, there is not going to be a breakdown ever. So worker B would not even have a chance at all. Now, if worker A is a low type, even if worker A is a low type, it takes time for a breakdown to realize, right? So in this case, if worker A indeed generates a breakdown at this point, my belief for worker A drops to zero. At that point, I will hire worker B. And the worker B has the same dynamics as worker A. The belief shoots up if there is no breakdown. And if there is a breakdown, I also, uh, I also fire worker B and I turn to my outside option. So this picture shows the difference between the two uh, learning environment. For breakdown learning, without any signals, without any break, uh, without any signals, the belief will shoot up. Moreover, no matter how close PB is to PA, uh, worker A 
is living in a world as if there is only himself, right? So he is not intimidated by the competition from worker B. He gets a job, he keeps it as long as he doesn't mess up, okay? On the other hand, worker B has to wait for worker A to generate a breaks down before worker B gets a chance. Worker B will never have that chance if worker A is a high type. Even if worker A is a low type, worker B has to wait for the breakthrough, uh, breakdown to occur. So this will cause a significant delay in worker B's uh, employment. And this delay is there no matter how close PB is to PA, right? So no matter how close this, uh, these two priors are. So in terms of the formal result, uh, we show that uh, even as PB is super close to PA, the ratio of worker B's expected payoff to worker A's expected payoff approaches a number which is strictly smaller than one. So worker B is, all, is always getting a small fraction of worker A's payoff. So this fraction is how we are going to measure inequality uh, in the paper. We measure inequality by measuring worker B's payoff the ratio of worker B's payoff to that of worker A. So this ratio has two parts. The first part is one minus PA. So this is a probability that worker A is a low type. Worker B only gets a chance if worker A is a, is a low type. The second, the second part is number L over number L plus R. So this is the expected time it takes for worker A's low type to be revealed. Right. So these two parts, uh, shows uh, how inequality will change as the environment change, right? So uh, naturally, if learning is faster, like if lambda L is higher, this second term will be higher. So worker B, uh, the, the inequality will be smaller. And uh, even if lambda L is infinity, this ratio is not going to one. This ratio is one minus PA. So no matter how fast the employer learns about the worker's type, the inequality will not disappear. Okay. So this is, uh, this is the contrast that we have between breakthrough and breakdown learning environment. Uh, any questions so far? I would have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So if you, if you have an environment where PB and PA are almost the same, then mm -hmm. maybe if you have many employers, then some of them have PA larger than PB, and some have PB larger than PA, but then on average, you wouldn't see any discrimination. Is that right? So you are saying, I see, I see what you are saying. So you are saying, uh, it's true that we have a binary type case. So here we are. You are saying that the, uh, the distribution, for the distribution, if we have uh, some A workers are better, X anti better than B workers, and some B workers are X anti better than A workers. What happens? Is that your question, Martin? Right, so here, here there's one employer who has this belief that PA is better than PB, but only by a small amount, then another employer would have just the opposite uh, ordering, right? You mean, I, I see, I see. So in a large sample of employer worker pairs, you wouldn't see any, you wouldn't see discrimination in that sense because they will, on average, <laughs> Some higher A, some higher Bs, and that's it. That's a very, that's a very good question. We're we not modeling that, so we are we're assuming that all the employers have the same belief, and this prior is PA for worker A and PB for worker B. Right? So we're not assuming heterogeneous prior beliefs for that. Uh, I think it will be very interesting to see what happens uh, when employers have different uh, beliefs. I would... Uh, uh, I, I still believe that even in that cases, uh, even in that situation, there are some prior belief distributions that would still lead to the same contrast. But uh, I think there, there will be many more interesting things to say. But you are hinting to what we are going to say when what happens in the large market. Right? So we have many employers and many employees. So one clarifying question, the second term, mm -hmm. the second mm -hmm. factor in the previous slide in the... You mean uh, this one? Yeah, so... Mm -hmm. You said this was the expected time it takes for the bad signal to arrive? You can think That's about this. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. It's the opposite, right? It's like the duration, expected discounted duration of you being employed, where after yeah. bad signal has arrived, right? I should use a better word. This reflects uh, the delay it takes yeah. for, the, for the, yes, you're right. Yonko, you are 100% right. So this reflects the delay it takes for the low type to be revealed. 
Uh, yeah. So, uh, so we have seen that a small uh, initial difference has uh, essentially no long-term impact on the breakthrough learning, but it grants a huge advantage to worker A on the breakdown learning. This advantage to worker A is there even if the learning is uh, instant. So this contrast is robust to many different variations of the model. Uh, in particular, it holds when uh, we look at the case when the uh, there is misspecified belief by the employer. So in this misspecified belief section, we discuss what happens when the two works actually are objectively the same, but the employer believe that worker A is better than worker B. So everything stays the same in that um, misspecified belief session. Uh, we have also discussed inclusive breakthrough and breakdowns, the results generalized to that setting as well. So for the uh, last uh, 10 minutes I have, I'll talk about uh, large labor market and the possibly flexible wages. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, good. So for this large labor market, uh, we are going to assume that there is a unit mass uh, of employers. You can, uh, each employer has one task. So there are uh, a unit mass of tasks to allocate at each moment of time. And there is alpha mass of A workers, and there is beta mass of uh, B workers. So both alpha and beta are greater than zero, right? So you can think about this as an environment in which there are 100 employers, 120 A workers, ADB workers. Uh, we assume relative task scarcity. So there are more workers than tasks. For the talk, we assume that there are actually more A workers than the tasks. So at time zero, B workers don't have a chance. And we assume friction is matching between the employers and the, the, the workers. So at each moment of time, the tasks will go to uh, the best uh, workers in the labor market at that moment of time. Okay. Now, uh, so this is an illustration picture. So this left-hand side represents the one unit mass of uh, employers and we have alpha mass of A workers and we have beta mass of B workers. So uh, at time zero, so the employers will definitely assign tasks to A workers. So now let's look at what happens over time on the breakthrough versus on the breakdown environment. So on the breakthrough environment, uh, there are two, phase, uh, two phases. In the first phase, the employer will let all the A workers take turns to perform tasks, right? So all the A workers look identical to the employers. They would try all these A workers either by splitting the tasks or by letting uh, A workers take turns to perform tasks. So after some time, some small fraction of A workers here, they will generate breakthroughs and they will prove themselves. So these A workers will be tenured. They will secure their job from, uh, uh, from the employer from, that, from the moment they generate breakthroughs. Now the remaining A workers, they have tried uh, to perform tasks, but they didn't succeed. So the belief for them will drop to PB. So from that point onward, a workers, the remaining A workers look identical to the B workers. So we enter phase two. So in phase two, the employer, remaining employers will let all the remaining A workers and B workers take turns to perform tasks. So you can see it's very similar to what we have seen before, right? So we have a grace period for A workers. They are the only workers that are hired, but after some time, uh, the employer will extend the hiring practice to a broader set of workers. And uh, after some time, some A workers will generate breakthrough and some B workers will generate breakthrough. If PB is super close to PA, the first phase is very, very short. And eventually a similar fraction of B workers will be tenured uh, as the, I mean, the fraction of A workers that are tenured will be similar to the fraction of B workers that are tenured if phase one is very, very short. So this is again, uh, the self-correcting uh, 
property of the breakthrough envi uh, environment. Actually, our result is very consistent uh, to this description by Barra and Krebs when they talk about the hiring practice in a star job. So for a star job, the costs of a hiring error is very, are very small relative to the upside potential from finding an exceptional individual. Therefore, the organization will wish to sample very, very widely among many employees looking for the one pearl among the pebbles. So in terms of uh, group discrimination, uh, the consequence is that as PB is very close to PA, this broad hiring practice will generate a similar payoff to A workers and B workers. Okay. Now, let's look at what happens. Any questions? Let's look at what happens uh, in this large market when we have breakdown learning. So for breakdown learning, the one unit of employers will lock one unit of A workers. They will first hire this one unit. And uh, if no worker generates a breakdown, they look better than the prior and uh, the employer will stick to that. So in this process, the employer will not, will be very conservative. Right? So the employer will not expand uh, their search unless a worker generates a breakdown. So when, after some time in this phase one, some A workers will generate breakdowns and will reveal themselves to be low type. So for example, these A workers will generate breakdowns, so they are fired permanently. Now, the employer will hire a new A worker each time an A worker generates a breakdown. So this replacement process is one by one. Every time an A worker generates a breakdown, he is kicked out of the force and a new A worker is, is replaced. And then a new A worker enters the, 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 uh, enters the task force. So this process goes from the top until the bottom one by one. So no matter how close PB is to PA, all the B workers have to wait for all the way A workers to be tried and sufficiently many A workers to fail. So that's the time at which B workers enter the task force. And uh, each time an A worker generates a breakdown, a new B worker is hired and is, is entering the labor force. The consequence of this one by one replacement is that eventually only a very small fraction of B workers will be tried and an even smaller fraction of B workers will secure their job uh, from the employers. And uh, as you can see, uh, in the end, you'll see that uh, the proportion of A workers who are eventually hired will be much larger than the, uh, the prior proportion before, they, before the game starts. Okay. Any questions? So this process is the opposite of sampling widely on the break through learning. B workers are hired only after sufficiently many A workers failed. And even if PB is super close to PA, the delay in employment for B workers does not vanish. So B workers expect a smaller payoff than A workers do. So this larger market uh, setting actually allows us to look at how the labor supply and the demand would affect inequality across different groups. So we can vary alpha and beta to see when the labor supply increases, how uh, the inequality uh, look like. So in particular, we show that in the limit when PB is super close to PA, the ratio of the expected payoff of a B worker to that of an A worker will decrease in both alpha and beta. So in other words, whenever you increase the size of group A or you increase the size of group B, you always hurt group B more than you hurt group A. So the inequality is always getting larger whenever labor uh, supply increases. For this result, uh, there are two parts, right? The first part is, is more intuitive. So what happens when we have more B workers? When we increase alpha, we have more B workers. We intensify the competition among the B workers, but we are not affecting a workers pay off at all because A workers are tried first. So they are not, 
they live there as if there are no bee workers, right? So in this case, of course, the bee workers are hurt more than we hurt, uh, than A workers are. So inequality will increase. The less intuitive part is what happens when we increase the size of A workers. So if we increase alpha, there are two effects. We intensify the competition among A workers. We also delay the employment for B workers. Uh, in the paper, we show that uh, B workers are always hurt more because whenever we add one A worker to the labor force, we uniformly delay every B worker's employment. So this effect is larger. So that's why uh, B workers are hurt more than A workers are. Okay. Another implication of this uh, proposition is that when the labor demand decreases, for example, during COVID, during economic downturns, our result shows that uh, while all the groups will suffer during economic downturns, the discriminated groups will always suffer more uh, in this type of situation. Okay, so that's the uh, breakdown learning environment. Uh, that's uh, uh, how the inequality changes as labor supply and the demand changes. So uh, I have I'm already running over uh, time, but I'll just talk a little bit like spend the last two minutes. One minute uh, will be about how we model flexible wages and uh, I will use the other minute to wrap up. During the Q&A session, I'm willing to talk more about the flexible wage uh, part. This is the part that we are all very excited about. Right? So uh, for the flexible wages, uh, we introduced this flexible wage to the large market you just, uh, you just saw. And in this case, a stage game outcome will specify how workers are matched to employers as before. It will also specify a non-negative wage for each matched employer and worker pair. So in the paper, we characterize the stable stage game matching uh, using the solution concept of Shapley and Schubig. And we show that that stable stage game matching is essentially unique. And then we prove that prescribing the stable stage game matching after each history is actually dynamically stable. So uh, we use the solution concept in Ali and Liu. So in their paper, actually stable stage game matching is trivially dynamically stable, but in our uh, employer learning environment, this takes a proof and it takes an assumption that wage is non-negative. So for uh, by this machinery, we are able to characterize the, uh, the wage path of two different groups. So this is a summary picture. This left-hand side is what we have seen before. This is the wage gap between the two groups. So this is in a spiraling environment. And even if PB is super close to PA, the two groups will have very different wage gap. And the right-hand side is what we call the payoff gap. So the right-hand side has, is a combination of both the wage gap and the employment gap, right? So the payoff incorporates the, the payoff of both employed and unemployed workers. So you can see the payoff gap is even larger than the wage gap, okay? So the wage is just for employed worker. So then uh, let me move to the summary, okay. So, uh, so uh, there is a perception that how economically relevant statistical discrimination is depends on how fast employers learn about workers' productive types. In this paper, we show that uh, the speed of learning is not enough. The nature of the employer learning or the direction of employer learning is crucial for early career discrimination. And we show that in spiraling environments, early career discrimination has a very, very significant impact on the discriminated uh, group. And uh, this is a, a relatively pessimistic message to take away in the sense that even if the productivity uh, gap is very, very small, we might still see a very large wage and employment gap across social groups. And so the contrast between breakthrough and breakdown learning uh, is already hinted at in this description by Long and Lehman. They show that while it's challenged to explain earning difference between black and white men, there is an even greater challenge, uh, which is to explain the existence of wage differentials 
uh, in low skilled uh, occupations and their absence in high skilled occupations. So we offer a theory for that variation across different occupations, break uh, low skill uh, occupations uh, tend to be breakdown environment and high skill tend to be uh, breakthrough, but more empirical work is needed for uh, uh, to test the contrast between the two. And uh, lastly, thank you very much for your time. Any questions? So I have a um, just a question about the flexible wages. Since you didn't have little time, maybe you wanna use this my question of mine to you know yes. explain a bit more. So what what are the punchlines there? So are you saying that you know you all you said that I got was that the uh, you can you can you can develop a model of flexible wages mm. and so, have some stability. But are you saying that the the same the the results the qualitative results you have hold robustly even in the presence of flexible wages? Mm. And and I mean and that's one question. I assume that that's probably the case. But is there any anything interesting in, in the way of wage dynamics that you are able to say that's kind of a, I mean it doesn't go to the heart of your message but maybe interesting maybe on its own right I see so uh, thank you Yonku that's actually a lifeline question because I really want to talk about this part yeah so uh, actually the first we we actually finished the paper like uh, one year ago but the flexible wage part is why we are holding this, we were holding this paper, right? So we really, we spend a lot of time to think about how to model uh, flexible wage in this environment. I think the, the main one, the first punchline is the following. So there is a widespread perception that if wages are flexible, then we shouldn't be seeing these employment differentials across different groups if the groups are very similar to each other. So in other words, if flexible wage, if we have flexible wages, uh, flexible wages will be able to cure spirally uh, because PA is super close to PB. So that's one punchline. So one takeaway from this is to show that actually flexible wages don't cure spirally. So, so that, what stops the, let's say, B worker from uh, offering to make up for the shortfall in the beginning so that the work employer hires him instead of the other person? Yeah, so, but the B workers will be outbid by A workers, right? So, I see. In that, yeah, so in that case, this is actually the, uh, uh, this is what happens in a flexible. So there is, so this leads to the, uh, first of all, you are 100%, right? The contrast between breakthrough and breakdown still uh, holds in this uh, flexible wage part. And uh, so in that case, I will just focus on breakdown environment because for the breakthrough, you would see similar wage paths for the two groups. And the other punchline I want to emphasize is the, we really want to emphasize is that the perception that the flexible wages will, all, will cure spiraling is a perception about, uh, uh, is a perception in the st uh, static world. So I will show you that in a static world, mm -hmm. if workers are similar to each other, even if we have, uh, even if we have uh, the statistical discrimination, we would not see very large payoff gap. So, but before that, I need to introduce a little bit the concept, right? So the, the result, the solution. So we show that uh, when we apply uh, this solution concept of Shapley and Schubig, the stable stage gain matching is characterized by uh, a history dependent marginal productivity PM. So the worker, if if you are better than this marginal productive worker, you are hired. If you are worse, you are not hired that period. And for the workers that are better, their payoff is the extra surplus they generate relative to the marginal productive worker. So that's very intuitive. And this is a, con the, the worker's payoff is convex. So the convexity here is very important. Convexity means that if I learn more about a worker's type, that worker on average is expecting a higher payoff. So uh, the, the, the short intuition 
for spiraling under breakdown is that uh, more learning about a worker's type would generate a higher expected payoff. That's the first uh, uh, part of the proof. The second part is saying that uh, this is exactly your question: Why we, why worker B don't uh, out be uh, don't bid to be employed? So the delay in employment for B workers does not vanish even if PB is very close to PA. This is because at each moment of time, always the best workers are hired, even if wages are flexible. So the flexible wage would not change the hiring dynamics we have seen in the large labor market, and. Uh, so now this means that by the time we hire B workers, A workers are already, they already have a very high reputation, right? So they, they are already employed for a substantial amount of time. If they are still employed, that means they haven't generated a breakdown. So this explains why uh, uh, spiraling uh, flexible wages don't fix spiraling. So the last picture I want to show you is uh, the contrast between static award and the dynamic award. So this is the payoff for whom? This is the uh, this is the payoff of worker. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. And so, PM is what? PM is the marginal productivity worker. I see. So basically, okay. you hire one unit of workers, so there is a marginal productive worker. Yeah. yeah. So if you look at this picture, left hand side picture, this is a, what happens in one period. So in this period, A workers are, this is exactly our model just in one period. A workers are slightly better than B workers. So A workers are hired. But as you can see, this green line is workers payoff is a continuous function of, of the belief. So that means if B is very close to A in terms of productivity, in terms of P, then B is expecting the same payoff, similar payoff as A, uh, as A does. So even if only A workers are hired, A workers get a zero wage from this game. So this is, I think this is what people have in mind when they say flexible wages should be able to cure spiraling, right? So in a static world, if two groups of workers are similar in terms of prior, they will expect a similar payoff. Now, if we go, if we do this for one more period, right? In the first period, only A workers are hired because they are at the margin. And then we will generate a signal about A workers. So in the breakdown environment, A workers believe will split to PA upper bar and to zero. This splitting will lift A's payoff in the second period to W2. And that's much higher than zero. Right, so this is from the, this picture actually shows why people believe that flexible wages could cure spiraling, but why actually it doesn't if we have dynamic learning. Right, right. Yeah. I see. But thank you. Very, very good. Yeah, mm -hmm. very good. So, so this is, uh, you are dealing with the market environment, which is why you're using Shapley and Shubik, right? Yes. What if the, so you seem to be assuming that everything is, uh, so employment history with one firm is observable to other employers. Yeah, we, we, are, we are assuming, yes, we are assuming that everything is public. Right. Uh, uh, we actually, we thought a little bit, so we, we read the paper by Qingming and uh, uh, other courses very carefully, and we wouldn't be able to yeah. say much yeah, along that line. Yeah. Um, I was actually wondering, and that relates to the question from before, um, how could a good affirmative action look like? You know, so I, I was wondering, like, could you introduce, could you introduce more certification and that would be good? Or should you like force, you know, for these guardian jobs, force somehow um, employers to take uh, <laughs> more people in? Or what would you, do you, did you think about that too? We actually, <laughs> I saw uh, Ajada nodding here. She, uh, so we actually spent quite a lot of time uh, on affirmative action, but eventually in the paper, we only had a very short discussion in the conclusion. Uh, the main reason for a short discussion in the final paper uh, is that we, we, we feel that that topic deserves a whole paper, a whole new paper. But here is a short, uh, is a very short overview of that result. If you think about the breakthrough learning environment, and you say, you tell the employer, you have to hire B worker for a period of time. But after that, affirmative action obligation is lifted. 
bee workers believe is likely to drop. So by the time there is no affirmative action, employer actually would switch to A workers immediately. But if it's a breakdown environment, you ask employer to hire B workers. And after a short period of time, B workers actually would the belief would look much better, right? So in this case, even if that is lifted, uh, obligation is lifted, employer will stick stay with B workers, most likely, unless B workers has generated breakdown. So in other, so a quick summary is that there is a contrast in terms of the effect of affirmative action in breakthrough and breakdown environment. And uh, breakdown environment, affirmative action is more likely to help the discriminated groups in the breakdown environment. As we show, actually they are needed. Right? The only, only uh, caveat we have, like a, a long discussion we have is that if you, it's very unfair, it might be very unfair for A workers if you impose the affirmative action for too long, right? So you also, so in general, breakdown environment is an environment that a, a very long affirmative action will hurt group A so much that uh, it's also unequal. So that's, yeah, but thank you very much for the question. Yeah. So in fact, I mean, if you have, if you text the, um, in the breakdown environment, if the tax the hiring of for a worker, mm. and if the amount of tax exceeds the gap, you could have a reverse spiral in favor of B workers, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's, I couldn't put it better. Reverse spiral, yeah. It's, we could have a reverse spiral for A workers if the affirmative action period it happens to push PB above PA. Yeah. So that's why in the in the current discussion, uh, our discussion is mostly uh, positive about affirmative action. How affirmative action will have different impacts uh, on the two different environments is not normative. <laughs> yeah. Um, let me thank uh, first of all Yingyi for the very nice presentation.